It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Jim Clorin is a Senior Scientist Emeritus at the U.S. Geological Service in Menlo Park, California. He just completed a 43-year career at USGS, learning how estuaries respond to human activities and variability on the climate system. I won't list all of the awards he received during that time because it's a really long list, but he is now retired, but he is not done, which is lucky for all of us. This seminar is the third and final in our series on integrating the Bay and Delta, um, but since this topic interests you, I have some good news. It will be featured at the State of the Estuary Conference in October. Please join me in welcoming Jim Clern. Can we, uh, can we dim the lights? Yeah, I'll turn off the lights. Yeah. Can you hear me okay in the back? Let's see, what do we need to do to... Oh. I'll take care of that. We have a finicky wire. Oh, okay. Nobody breathes. <laughs> <laughs> So this is obviously not a photograph taken in the Delta. Um, this is a photograph that was taken uh, off the coast of Israel in the, uh, in the Gulf of Eilat, which is part of the Red Sea. And the Red Sea is a deep, warm, low nutrient region of the ocean. And you can see that it supports this beautiful coral reef system. You can see the diversity of coral, corals and, and fish. And I'm starting uh, with a little bit of history of, of this coral system to illustrate the main point of this presentation. And the point is about change. Coastal systems are changing over time, sometimes in surprising ways. And in 1999, sorry, 1992, this coral reef system changed to a completely different state uh, that looks like this. And you can see that the coral reef system was, was overwhelmed by this prol proliferation of algal growth, both macroalgae and phytoplankton. Uh, it was a, an important source of mortality for many, many of the corals, and it completely transformed this, the, the system in a short amount of time. When we think about algal blooms like this, we think about nutrient enrichment. And this particular event actually was a response to nutrient enrich an event of nutrient enrichment, but it wasn't from land runoff like, like we normally think about. The source of nutrients was the deep ocean. So nutrient concentrations are high in, in the bottom, but they're usually isolated from the surface layer by stratification. And there was a climate event that allowed for mixing of the Red Sea that brought deep nutrient-rich ocean water to the surface and where nutrients are in the surface layer with sunlight, algae can proliferate, they can grow really quickly. And this mixing event was the result of a climate anomaly over the Middle East, uh, a cooling event, and cooling of the air over the Red Sea cools the surface waters. As the surface waters get cooler, they get denser. As they get denser, they sink. And so this allowed for mixing of the water column that brought nutrients to the surface. So what was behind this climate anomaly, this cool period in the Middle East that triggered this transformation of this coral reef system? And in a paper that, when I read it in 1992, I think, a fascinating paper that was published in, in uh, Science Magazine, in Nature, um, this cooling event that triggered this algal bloom was a response to a volcanic eruption, the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines. And this eruption ejected a mass of fine particles in the atmosphere that attenuated light penetration to, to the landmass and cooled this, this region of, of the planet. So I'm starting with this example to make really just the one point that I want to make in this talk. And that is that ecosystems like the San Francisco Bay and Delta, like this coral reef system, can be transformed by events that happen far away. And in this particular case, that event was 6,000 miles away. So there is a connection, in this case through the, the, the westerly flow of these particles in the atmosphere that originated from this, up, this eruption, there was a connection that spanned the continent from Asia to, to, to the Middle East. Okay, 
So that's kind of the setup for what I would like to talk about. So I'm going to come home now, and we're going to talk about San Francisco Bay and the Delta. And I want to give you some examples of observations that we've made that have shown us um, um, that San Francisco Bay also responds to global scale processes. And I think you all know that um, the coupled San Francisco Bay Delta system is one of the very best studied estuarine systems in the world. We have observations that go back half a century, and the data contained in those observational records give us opportunities to uh, observe changes over time and relate them to large-scale processes, global-scale processes. So I'd like to give you four examples of how the bay is connected to large-scale forcing, it's just like that coral reef system uh, was connected. So I want to start with a relatively recent event. Um, and you can see that this is an image of the Pacific Ocean on the west coast of North America. The color over the ocean represents temperature anomalies. The darker the red, the warmer the anomaly. And this was uh, an unprecedented climate anomaly that, that persisted over a large region of the Northeast Pacific Ocean of uh, this mass of, of warm water that was, that was uh, called the warm blob. And uh, in our observational program, in our USGS observational program in San Francisco Bay, one of the things that we measure is temperature in the estuary. And this warm blob that persisted over 2014 and 2015, those two years were the years of the highest temperature that we measured in San Francisco Bay. So it's an illustration of how a large-scale process has effects that propagate to the scale of estuaries like San Francisco Bay. So I'll show you some data. Um, the bottom panels here are plots for three months, January, April, and August, winter, spring, and summer. And each of these plots, in each of these plots, we're measuring along the salinity gradient. So the left-hand side of this image is in the Sacramento River, and we're sampling from the river to the central bay, so from river to ocean. And the y-axis is temperature. So if we look at this bottom graph here, this bottom, the red dots represent the mean temp surface temperature associated with a particular salinity going from the rivers to the ocean. And these are all the observations that we made from 1969 to 2013. And then the, the line above that shows the same plot of median temperature for particular salinities, but these are the values for 2014 and 2015. And so you can see that for every month, every Every spot along the salinity range, temperatures were warmer, sometimes by as much as three degrees centigrade. So we would have had no clue uh, about why we had uh, unprecedented warm surface waters in the bay along the entire salinity gradient from the delta to the coastal ocean without knowing what was going far away in the Northeast Pacific Ocean. And so the key here, the key message here is that in order for us to understand things like temperature variability in the bay, we need to know what's going on at a much larger scale, over ocean basin scale. So this is a climate anomaly that developed over a period of a couple of years. Uh, the next example that I want to give is about natural oscillations of the climate system and its effect on the Pacific Ocean that have per much longer periods on the order of three or four decades. And the, the second example that I want to give you is how the Bay and its biological communities responded to a big shift in climate forcing over the North Pacific Ocean that happened in 1999. So I need to kind of walk through this figure on, on the left and get you oriented. So we're looking at the region of the North Pacific Ocean from Asia to North America. The colors of the Pacific represent, the different colors represent different sea level height. And sea level height is important because it controls currents. And the basic message here is that there are two different modes of climate forcing of the North Pacific Ocean. One is called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, the PDO, and it's characterized by this one counter-rotating gyre uh, south of Alaska. The second mode is called the North Pacific Gyre Oscillation, the NPGO, and it's a very different pattern in that it has two counter-rotating gyres. So the the uh, counterclockwise gyre is pushed to the north, and below that, at, at mid-latitudes, is a clockwise rotating gyre. So what, this is important because these two different climate modes over the North Pacific Ocean 
uh, lead to very different patterns of winds, wind-driven currents, uh, and coastal upwelling along the coast of North America. So the PDO pattern is one of relatively weak alongshore currents, relatively weak coastal upwelling, relatively small inputs of deep nutrients to the surface, relatively low primary production, and low pr production at higher trophic levels, the trophic levels of krill, for example, and seabirds and mammals that, that feed on them. The NPGO pattern is very different. This is a pattern where at our latitude, the winds from north to south that drive upwelling are stronger than normal. Uh, the upwelling movement of nutrients to the surface layer is stronger than normal. Primary productivity is higher than normal along the coast, and so is productivity at higher trophic levels. And the, um, the, the North Pacific Ocean was in its PDO phase from the mid-1970s until 1999 and then it shifted to the NPGO phase. And because we have these wonderful observational programs in the Bay, and I'm gonna talk in particular about the Bay Studies Program of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife that every month samples a network of 45 sites for all fish species and large crustaceans like, like fish and shrimp. So that program began in 1980 and so we had about two decades of the, of the North Pacific Ocean in its PDO phase and then this abrupt shift to the other phase uh, after 1999. And, I, and their, their records showed a restructuring of biological communities in the bay. We're talking about the salty part of the bay now following that climate shift. So the upper panel here shows monthly variability of the North Pacific gyre oscillation. You can see that it was mostly in its negative state and then abruptly it shifted to its positive state and for most of the period after that stayed in that positive state. And then the three bar graphs below this represent indices of the annual population abundance of three different spe five different species of demersal fish, including species like English sole. Below that, three different species of crabs, including Dungeness crab, and below that, two different species of shrimp. So you can see this synchrony between the population abundance of these, of these communities with the shift in the NPGO. These are all, these abundances were all below the long-term average, and then they shifted up to unprecedented high numbers a year or two after this climate shift. The explanation for this, and this is an explanation that we don't have observations to support, but the explanation for this is that, again, the NPGO, when it's in its positive state, strong upwelling, high nutrient concentrations in the coastal ocean, high biological productivity, including production of, of larval and juvenile forms of these marine species that are, that are produced in the ocean and then migrate into estuaries like San Francisco Bay. So the basic thought is that when we shifted from, from the warm, low productivity phase across the ocean to the cool, high productivity phase, that generated large numbers of these juveniles that then migrated into the bay. So these are ocean-derived organisms that use the bay for rearing in the first year or two of their life cycle. This was, uh, this was a complete surprise to us. Um, and it's pretty compelling uh, observational record showing a connection between the climate state, state of the Northeast Pacific Ocean and biological communities inside San Francisco Bay. And again, we, would n we wouldn't have a prayer of understanding these record high abundances of all these different species of fish and large crustaceans in the bay without knowing what was going on in the coastal ocean, uh, not the coastal ocean across the entire North Pacific uh, basin. So a pretty clean example of, of connectivity uh, between large-scale climate forcing at the ocean basin scale and biological communities in the bay. And the mechanism of that connectivity is just simply the migration of these marine species into the estuary and more of them being produced in one climate phase than the other. The next example that I want to give has to do with variability of precipitation, runoff, and freshwater inflow to San Francisco Bay. So this bottom graph here shows the, um, the annual variability of freshwater inflow to the, to the estuary. I think this is the delta outflow index. And you can see that there's a lot of year-to-year -year variability in the amount of freshwater that flows into the estuary. It's, the, the, the freshwater inflow to our estuary is much more variable than the freshwater inflow to estuaries on the East Coast, such as the Chesapeake Bay. And one of the things that we've, one of the important lessons that we've learned 
in the last decade or so is that much of this variability of precipitation and freshwater inflow is tied to another large-scale ocean, ocean basin scale process, and that is the development of these atmospheric rivers of moisture-laden water that are carried to the east, they hit the continent, that water vapor is condensed into precipitation that then falls on the watershed and generates runoff. And we've learned in the last couple of years that most, not most, much of the variability from year to year in precipitation and runoff into the estuary is associated with the number of atmospheric rivers that hit the continent on an annual basis. So very wet years like 1983, um, were years with large numbers of atmospheric rivers, um, and dry years, like the series of dry years in the late 80s and early 90s, were years of either no atmospheric rivers forming or a small number. So here's an example of an ocean basin scale process having an effect on the watershed, precipitation and runoff in the watershed, that then has a downstream effect on the rivers and the estuaries. And of course, we know a lot about the fact that fish populations in the estuary respond to these global scale processes. And again, we know this because of this wonderful Bay Studies program of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. They've identified over the decades 137 different fish species in, in the estuary. And this is a little table that I extracted from a paper that Fred Fire published um, four years ago. And what it shows us is that for several species of demersal fish and pelagic fish, there are strong associations between ocean condition, in this case indexed as the NPGO, and population abundance of those species. So in terms of demersal fish, some species like English sole are positively associated with the NPGO. Others, like white croaker, are negatively associated. This probably has to do with the different temperature requirements because one phase is cool and one phase is warm. And in terms of pelagic fish, some of the important pelagic fish like northern anchovy and Pacific herring have low abundances when, the, when we're in the NPGO phase. Others have high abundances when we're in that phase. So there's a clear connection between population variability of fish in the fish populations in, in the estuary and this, this uh, climate mode of the North Pacific that operates over this very large scale. And then we also know from this wonderful uh, uh, observational program that there are strong connections between freshwater inflow and the population abundances of some species of fish. So for example, two different species of demersal fish and two different species of pelagic fish like longfin smelt and striped bass have higher than average uh, population abundances during years of higher than average uh, delta outflow. So one of, these, one of these regulators, one of these controls on population abundance is tied to biological productivity in the coastal ocean, upwelling in the coastal ocean, <laughs> winds along the coast, and the other is tied to the number of uh, atmospheric rivers that form over the North Pacific Ocean. Okay, the last ex example that I want to give, and it's one that you all know really well, and, and that is that in addition to these climate-driven uh, factors that connect the atmosphere, uh, ocean to the bay, there's another kind of ocean estuary connectivity that's played a major role in shaping biological communities, and that's transoceanic shipping. And um, I want to show you a map of the shipping lanes around the world. So the red lines here show all of the world's shipping lanes. And to kind of get you oriented, so this is North America here, this is the Pacific, and uh, I've highlighted where San Francisco Bay is to get you oriented. I think it's pretty clear from this image that as a response to transoceanic shipping and the fact that, sh that as ships traverse oceans at their point of departure, they take in ballast water with its living communities, and re when they reach their point of destination, they discharge that ballast water with those, with whatever's left in the, of those communities that's still alive. And so what this means is that the process of moving species along these shipping lanes in ballast water is that all of the world coastlines, their biological communities are connected. And this has played a major role in shaping biological communities of San Francisco Bay. You know that it's been described as the most invaded estuary. It has well over 200 species of non-native plants and animals. Some of those introductions were through discharge of ship ballast. 
many of the animals that are present in the plankton and the benthos are indigenous to estuaries and rivers of, of the West Pacific. And some of, and again, because we have these wonderful observational records, we have a really solid understanding what, of what the ecological consequences of these species introductions have been. And the example that you all know, and it's, it's an example that's known around the world, it's such a compelling example, is the restructuring of pelagic communities in the low salinity parts of the estuary after a species introduction, almost certainly from discharge of ship ballast. Um, and that was the introduction of the small clam indigenous to Asia, either corbula or botamocorbula, depending on where the taxonomists are. So these are data from Sassoon Bay. These are data from the Interagency Ecological Program. And uh, you see that, uh, and these are data that span from 1975 to a little bit after 2010. Uh, and this, this small clam was first discovered in Sassoon Bay in the autumn of 1986. And a year later, its population had exploded. It carpeted the sediments of Sassoon Bay and regions downstream. This is a filter feeder, and the total volume of water filtered by this, by this uh, introduced species was enough to remove phytoplankton biomass from the overlying water column. So the second graph here shows that once corbula or botamicorbula was established in Sassoon Bay, uh, phytoplankton biomass measured as chlorophyll dropped to uh, low levels and has remained low ever since. Our measurements of primary productivity showed that phytoplankton producti primary productivity before and after this introduction decreased by a factor of five. And a five-fold reduction of primary productivity is a major shock to an ecosystem. And as you all know, there were consequences that ramified throughout the food web, and in particular, species that rely upon phytoplankton as their primary food resource, like rotifers, uh, calanoid copepods, and the native mice, Neomyces mercedes, their populations all uh, collapsed, or, or the, some of these species have virtually, uh, vir virtually disappeared. And the explanation for that is food limitation and out competition by this invasive clam for the phytoplankton food resource by the, by the native uh, or the, the established communities of, of zooplankton. So the copepod communities in the low salinity part of the estuary now look very much like the communities in estuaries and rivers of the West Pacific. So the, the main kind of point here is that in order for us to understand variability of things like temperature, water quality, and biological communities in the estuary, we have to have a really good sense of what's going on at much larger scales, from ocean basin to global scale processes. So there's connectivity from large scale to the local scale. Um, next, I'd like to talk about examples of regional scale processes that drive variability in the estuary. And when I'm using the word regional scale, I'm talking about the watershed, and I'm talking about the immediate connection of the bay to the Gulf of, of Farallons. So the, the boundaries between the estuary and the ocean and the watershed. And when I think about regional scale processes that, uh, that, that occurred in, in the watershed and had a downstream effect on the bay, the very first thing that I think about is this one, hydraulic mining. So this is a process that went on for almost three and a half decades in the late 1800s. And you can see that, that the process was using high pressure water jets to tear down hill slopes on the western slope of the Sierras to make ores available for extraction of gold. And the process um, mobilized large quantities of boulders, gravel, sand, and fine sediments that were carried downstream, settled in the river system, and then downstream into San Francisco Bay. And in maybe the first real uh, impressive piece of scholarship done in San Francisco Bay was done by the geologist G.K. Gilbert in the early 1900s uh, at the USGS. He did many different kinds of measurements and came to the conclusion that this process uh, led to the, uh, the deposition of a billion, with a B, cubic meters of sediment in San Francisco Bay. So here's an example of an activity that was hundreds of miles away from San Francisco Bay that had a big effect on the sediment supply to the bay and its geomorphology. And we know about the geomorphological changes because of the work that 
uh, Bruce Jaffe at the USGS and his colleagues have done to try to reconstruct what the effects of hydraulic gold mining were on the shape of the bay floor. And the way in which they did this was very clever. clever. They took all of the bathymetric surveys that have ever been done for San Francisco Bay, they digitized them, and the first survey that was done was in 1856, long before hydraulic mining began. The second one was done in 1887, a couple of years after it had ended. And this map of the San Pablo Bay region is the difference between water depths from those two surveys. And red represents area where the water got shallower, in other words, where the bottom, um, where, where there was deposition of sediments. Um, and the, the dark red represents areas that filled in by on the order of three meters. Um, so one of the consequences of this activity in the watershed was changing sediment supply, increased sediment supply and deposition leading to changes in the geomorphology of the bay. Uh, Bruce Chaffee and his colleagues did this for all of the embayments of the system, added them up, and miraculously they added up to a number pretty close to a billion cubic meters. This guy a century and a half ago was smart enough to figure out what that number was, and he was pretty damn close. Um, now, you all know that, um, that this era of hydraulic mining, increasing sediment supply to the rivers and the estuary was followed by a very different era in the early 20th century, and that was the era when we began to dam all of the large rivers. And um, this graph here shows the time series in the total cumulative storage capacity of reservoirs after, after new uh, dams were built and, and went online. So, for example, you see this step up when Shasta Dam went online in the mid-1940s. And by the end of the process, around 1980, we dammed all of the large rivers. We now have a capacity to store one of these numbers that's impossible for us to imagine. It's 50 uh, cubic kilometers of water. And to put that in perspective, that's double the median uh, precipitation over the entire watershed. So we obviously have the capability of capturing large volumes of water. And we've known for a lot of, long time that there are many downstream consequences of damming rivers, and I'm going to talk about one, and that is that the sediment generated by erosion of land and movement into rivers and then its down, downstream transport into estuaries uh, is a, a large fraction of that sediment is no longer mobilized and carried downstream because it's retained behind these dams. And so as we entered this era of dam construction and reservoirs going online, we've now reduced the sediment supply from the watershed to the estuary, and sediment concentrations are decreasing in the, in the estuary, and it's losing, it's losing sediment. So this is a plot showing the specific relationship between suspended particulate matter in Sassoon Bay over a 35-year period. There's been a significant decline of suspended particulate matter, which is suspended sediments in Sassoon Bay over time. These are, again, data from the IEP program. Um, so human activities in the watershed generated an era where we filled in the bay. It got shallower, and that was replaced by a different activity, a new era, where the bay is now losing more sediments to the ocean that it's, and it's receiving from rivers, and it's, and it's, and it's deepening. So two examples of how human activities in the watershed have effects on the downstream bay. You know that the Central Valley is, has been is an area of intense agricultural production. One of the outcomes of agricultural production is uh, mobilization and addition of nutrients, both nitrogen and phosphorus as fertilizers. Uh, some of that runs off into the rivers and is, and is carried into the estuary. This time series shows nitrate concentrations in the San Joaquin River going back to the 1950s, and you can see this steady increase of nitrate, nitrate that began after we started this intense agriculturalization of, of the Central Valley. And to kind of put this in, number, in perspective, the units here are micromoles. 100 micromoles of nitrate is a very, very big number in terms of regulating algal growth, for example. So another activity in the watershed that has downstream effects on, on the bay. The bay is, in, is enriched in nutrients in part because of runoff from farm fields. Uh, next, I want to say something about a topic that is relatively new and we're just beginning to understand, and that is the topic of, uh, of algal toxins in San Francisco Bay, 
And uh, this is a collaborative work, the collaborative work that we've been doing with the San Francisco Estuary Institute and with Professor Rafe Cudella at UC Santa Cruz. And this is a bar graph that shows concentrations of two different algal toxins. The black bar is domoic acid, which causes paralytic shellfish poisoning. It's produced by a marine diatom of the genus Pseudonychia. And the red bar is microcystin, uh, a toxin produced by the freshwater cyanobacteria microcystis. These values here are values take, measured at, at different locations in San Francisco Bay, and, and the design was to take mussels from um, Tamales Bay, uh, place them in San Francisco Bay, and then harvest them later and measure their tissue concentrations of domoic acid and microcystin. And some of these values, the highest values, are alarming. There are values high enough that would trigger closure of shell fisheries if we had commercial shell fisheries in the bay. So this remains a mystery to us, the origin of these toxins that accumulate in, in mussels. We, we also are collecting samples that Rafe Codella's lab is measuring for concentrations of multiple algal toxins in bay waters and in particles. And they, they are present sometimes at levels of concern. So this leaves a question about connectivity of the bay both to the ocean and to freshwater systems. So one question that I think has become a priority question for us, is the ocean a source of domoic acid that's accumulated in mussels in San Francisco Bay? This is a map that shows um, along the west coast of North America regions of the coastal zone that are termed hot spots because of large production of pseudonychia biomass and, lar and their large production and excretion of, of domoic acid. So is the domoic acid that's accumulating in mussels inside San Francisco Bay, did it originate, was it produced in the coastal ocean and then carried into the bay? Was it pseudonychia cells produced in the coastal ocean that were carried into the bay that then produced domoic acid? Um, or is there a resident population of pseudonychia that's the origin of this domoic acid? So we've got some really fundamental questions about uh, about the source of, of domoic acid and other algal toxins that, um, that are pr produced by marine phytoplankton species. And it's relevant to this theme of regional scale forcing. This could be a regional scale process that's having an effect on water quality in the bay. And similarly, at the other end of the, at the, under end of the estuary, um, we were actually surprised to see high levels of microcystin in the bay because this organism doesn't, as far as we know, doesn't grow and produce microcystis in salty water. We're finding it in saltwater organisms at high, high salinities. Is the source, the, the microcystin that's produced upstream during these microcystis blooms that develop in the delta or in urban reservoirs around the shoreline of the bay? So we need to figure out uh, what the source of microcystin is in the bay, and it's going to require us to, to look re at a regional scale because it's unlikely that this, is, this toxin in particular is produced in the bay. Okay, the last scale that I want to talk about is local scale, and this is probably the scale of, of processes that we know and think the most about. There are many, and I'm just, I've, I just selected a few local scale processes that I want to talk about. Um, one of them is that San Francisco Bay is an urbanized, uh, is situated in an urbanized area. Uh, our population is seven and a half million people. Our treated waste is discharged into the bay uh, from 42 different sewage treatment plants. And sewage disposal is the, is the largest source of both nitrogen and phosphorus to San Francisco Bay. And to kind of put that in a global perspective, each of these circles here represents an a measurement or an estimate of the, of the total loading rate of, in this case, nitrogen to individual estuaries, um, and, and includes places like Venice Lagoon in, in Italy, Chesapeake Bay, Long Island Sound on our east coast. These are all places where water quality degradation has clearly been uh, a response to large nutrient inputs. And the units here are massive nitrogen per square meter of estuary per year. And when we put San Francisco Bay in a global, in this global perspective, it's in the 87th percentile. So in terms of sewage inputs of nitrogen to San Francisco Bay, it's one of the highest in, in the world. So this is an example of a local scale process um, from the, the urbanized landscape. Um, and so the, the bay is enriched, water quality has changed as a result of this local process. <clears throat> 
I think you all know of examples of how diverting fresh water from the delta has effects on the interior part of the delta. I want to show you some data from a measurement program that we had in Mildred Island, a flooded island in the center of the delta. And um, as you know, the state and federal uh, export pumps are in the south delta. And so as those pumps operate, water is drawn from the north to the south. And that has an effect on the relative proportion of Sacramento and San Joaquin water in the interior uh, delta with effects on water quality. So let me show you some data to illustrate that. Um, just look at these two uh, panels on the right here. And in particular, look at this panel here, which for the month of October, I can't remember what year this is, maybe 2001. We had a sensor in the middle of Mildred Island that was measuring salinity continuously. So the, the, the oscillations are tidal oscillations, but you see this trend of increasing salinity that occurred over a period of a month. And this puzzled us. We didn't understand what this increasing salinity was while we were taking measurements. And later we found out that this period of increasing salinity was a period when the pumping was reduced for a month. And so the idea here is that as pumping was reduced, there was a smaller fraction of low salinity Sacramento water in the central delta. It was replaced by a higher fraction of higher salinity uh, San Joaquin water. So here's a, another really clean example of how a local activity, in this case pumping water from, from the south of the delta, has an effect on the flow path and water quality in the interior of the delta. And I think you're all aware of this just remarkable work that the San Francisco Estuary Institute and its landscape ecology team has done to very carefully, very meticulously piece together um, many different uh, sources of information to patch together what the Delta landscape looked like in the early 1800s. Just a remarkable piece of work. And then compare that to what the, today's Delta landscape is. And their very careful analyses tell us that this was, of course, once a vast freshwater wetland, and 90% of those wetland habitats have, have been lost. So. When I think about landscape changes of this scale, as an ecologist, I start thinking, well, what did this mean ecologically? What, does, what did this mean in terms of ecosystem functions like primary production? So we proposed a study to the Delta Science Program that agreed to support this study. This is something that we're working on now to try to translate these landscape metrics into metrics of change in an important ecosystem function of primary production. And please don't remember or quote this number but the early indications are, this is not validated, not peer-reviewed, please don't, but the early indications are that that landscape change led to about a 75% loss of primary production, the primary production that supports aquatic food webs in the delta. So another large-scale disturbance of the system that was a consequence of large-scale, local-scale landscape change. Okay, so there's a lot here. I mean, I've shown you a lot of data. I've shown you a lot of, a lot of results. And the, the, to synthesize all of these data that I've shown you, I really just have one message here, and that is when we think about the San Francisco Bay Delta system, how it's changing, why it's changing, how it might change in the future, we have no prayer of answering those questions if we're only thinking, thinking locally. We need to broaden our thinking into um, a perspective that recognizes the importance of watershed scale processes and ocean basin scale and global scale processes. And the word macroscopic view co is, was coined by one of my science heroes, Scott Nixon, and he was trying to explain to people that if you want to understand the, the eutrophication problem of, of estuaries, you can't just think locally. There are large scale processes that play an important role and shaping how nutrients are turned into algal biomass in, in, est in estuaries. And from our wonderful observational programs in San Francisco Bay and the Delta, we know that the, many of the transformations that have taken place in the Delta and its ecosystem and in the Bay are the result of activities that are hundreds of miles away or thousands of miles away. So I think that what I'd like to do is kind of um, make the point that I think we need to change the, the, the way in which we view the delta and the coupled bay delta system and, and teach ourselves, learn how to take this macroscopic 
view, both when we're doing science and when we're thinking about policies and, and regulations to, to protect resources. Now, this is a pretty complicated system, and my oceanographer friends tell me, Jim, you guys are crazy to work in estuaries, and my limnologist friends tell me, Jim, you guys are crazy to work in estuaries, and they're probably right. These are certainly among the most complex ecosystems on the planet because they have all of these different forcings, the atmosphere of the ocean, the ocean itself, the atmosphere over the watershed, the watershed itself, these local, these local processes, connectivity across all of these boundaries. And I think we can, it's a reasonable question for us to ask, do we have the intellectual capacity to deal with this complexity and do we have the tools to deal with this complexity? And you know, I'm, I tend to be an optimist, and I think, yes, I think this is coming. I think we need to put much more e effort individually and collectively into taking the macroscopic view. But I want to give you one last example that illustrates how we can view ecosystems from this macro macroscopic lens. And this example is from a paper that was just published. I just saw this last week. Really interesting paper. It was published by the NOAA group out of Santa Cruz. The problem that they're working on is the question, what, control, what regulates the number of adult Chinook salmon that return to the, to the rivers after they've completed their, their maturation in the coastal ocean? And they're looking specifically at the fall run of Chinook salmon. So this circle here is a pretty complicated uh, diagram, and it represents the complicated life cycle of salmon. So it begins with uh, spawning, uh, fertilization of eggs that develop in reds that, that eventually hatch into larvae and juveniles that eventually migrate through the delta, through the bay, and then into the Pacific Ocean where they spend four years maturing before they then return. And so their question was, what determines how many, um, how many of, um, uh, what determines the number of adults that return to the river after, to spawn after this four-year cycle. And they did a really uh, interesting analysis with this model. They asked from the model, um, what, are the, what are the few essential steps in this life cycle that determine how many adults return to the rivers at the end of, at the end of this cycle? And what they found was that there are three important uh, steps in this life cycle that play unusually large roles in determining the success of uh, fall run Chinook salmon. And those three things are temperature of the rivers when the, where the eggs are incubating because it has an effect on egg survival. So that's number one. Number two is freshwater inflow because it affects survival of the juveniles who are migrating to the ocean. And the third one is ocean condition because it affects both the predation on juvenile salmon in the ocean as well as their food supply. And interestingly, they use the NPGO as their index of ocean condition. So here's an example of, to me it's a beautiful example of applying a macroscopic view, and you have to do that with a species that has a, a life cycle between rivers and, and oceans. And in this particular case, the three important components that determine success were a process in the rivers, water temperature, that's determined by both global scale and regional scale processes. Freshwater inflow, which is determined by global scale processes as well as uh, regional and local scale processes. And then ocean condition, which is determined by things like atmospheric pressure distributions over the North Pacific Ocean. So to me, this is, uh, this is good news. It's, a, I think, a really beautiful example of how we can apply the macroscopic view and if I had one piece of advice, it's that I think we need to make sure that we're thinking from a macroscopic lens when we're studying the bay and delta and when we are trying to figure out the best ways to sustain its resources. So thank you very much. We definitely have time for some questions. Steve has a tell you. There we go. Hi, Jim. Uh, thanks very much for your thoughts, as always. Um, my question through the fuzzy batteries is um, uh, 
if we um, agree that the macroscopic view is the one worth taking, um, what would you say about our ability to be predictive, even given that perspective? Are, are, is ecology sort of always sort of rooted in sort of explaining what we've seen? Or do you think there, if we take the proper perspective, do you think there's a chance at, at understanding what is coming, I mean, at a fundamental level, like predicting the number of returning fish, for example? Yeah, I, I have for this paper. I have that specific question for them. I mean, I'm curious. Have they taken these three stages and done scenarios of, of them for the future? A couple of things I want to say about this. One is, um, <clears throat> I, I think a logical response to my talk is, okay, we get it, Jim, but so what? Um, and and there's a lot to the so what question. And one of them is, it this makes it crystal clear to me that. There, if we think about all the factors that influence the things that we're trying to preserve or, or recover, there's some processes that are important that we just can't control. They're just out of our control. We have no control over whether the Pacific Ocean is going to be in its PDO stage or its, or its NPGO stage. So we have no control over, as far as we know, um, about the number of atmospheric rivers that are going to hit the North America in a year. And so what that tells us is that there's a limit, there are limitations to what we can accomplish through regulations and policies, because there's so many forces that are out of our control. And I think the way that we can deal with that, I don't think we throw up our hands, I think we acknowledge it, we embrace it, and I think that one of the ways that we can deal with that is if we're thinking about a specific regulatory action or a specific policy, that it's important for us to plan those regulations or those policies around scenarios that span the range of conditions that exist across the Pacific Ocean. So rather than making a prediction, do a scenario. If we implemented this policy and the North Pacific Ocean was in its PDO phase, what would that mean for the estuary? If we implement this policy and it was in the other phase, what would that mean for the estuary? Do we need different policies depending on what state that the coastal ocean is in? Um, and there's, there's an example of that, because from my work in the Bay, we've known for many decades that San Francisco Bay is highly enriched in nitrogen and phosphorus, much, much more highly enriched than Chesapeake Bay is or Long Island Sound. And those estuaries are clearly impaired by high nutrient levels, you know, large algal blooms, large productivity, anoxia in the summertime. San Francisco Bay doesn't. And we've explained, I think, historically why that is. The Bay has inherent res resistance mechanisms. And so for decades, because of our work, the regional board and others didn't really care much about nutrients. Okay, we know that nitrate's 50 molar, and we know that's high, but we're not seeing anoxia or harmful algal blooms. Um, and then things started changing. And after the 1999 climate shift, we started measuring uh, significant increases of phytoplankton biomass in the South Bay and the Central Bay, and it was tied to this restructuring of biological communities. Uh, we also started seeing, making it clear to ourselves and the regional board that in the community of phytoplankton in the Bay are about a dozen or a couple dozen species that are toxin producing, sometimes at levels of concern. After these things started happening, we started, we saw a big red tide event in 2004 that was tied to a, a heat wave. After these events uh, accumulated over a period of time, the regional board started taking real interest in the nutrient issue. So here's an example of where um, our understanding of the Bay and the issues that rise to the top of the priority list for regulatory agencies like the regional board changed in response to this shift in climate forcing over the, over the North Pacific. So I think it's an example of how our policies need to be adaptive to things like long-term droughts, major floods, um, what, what the level of productivity is in the coastal ocean, what's the temperature distribution in the coastal ocean. So I don't think we should throw our hands up. I think we should accept the fact that this is these large-scale processes are important. We don't have any control of them, but we do have control over the kinds of policies that we try to try to develop, the kinds of regulatory actions we try to develop, and make them adaptable to the range of scenarios that we've seen in the coastal ocean or in the watershed. So I think that the key lesson here for policymaking is the lesson that we have to be adaptable to these forces that we can't control. <clears throat> 
And then within the watershed, you know, it's a mix of things. There's some things in some of these processes in the watershed we do have control over and some we don't. And then at the local scale, that's where the control is tightest and we can have the greatest confidence, I hope, um, in the outcomes of the policies that we develop. I, 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 I'm kind of afraid to give this talk because I think you can get the message that this is so damn complicated that we just can't. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that we understand enough about, about this that we can deal with it. But I appreciate your question. Next question. Last chance. There, there. Keep it a little far away from from your okay. Hi. Um, it's kind of an I'm a non scientist trying to understand science for my own work in the legal field. But I guess when, as a scientist and speaking to non scientists in the crowd, what do you look for? I mean, you know, council, the Delta Council here has adopted a definition of best available science. A lot of papers I read, whether they're referring to the Delta or not, you know, this is the best available science or there's different phrases that get used. I mean, what do you look for when you read papers to try to determine whether you believe it will have information that's credible or useful? I'm gonna give a two-part answer to this question. The first part is, as a scientist, I bristle when I hear this. I mean, it just really, uh, it just really bothers me because, um, it has the underlying uh, uh, presumption that there's other science out, out there that, that isn't the best available. And what does available mean? I mean, I just, I hate that phrase. But I, somebody explained to me that it has legal meaning, and so you, 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 can't, afford, you can't avoid that. Um, you know, we are trained to read critically. We are trained to read and, and think critically. And I think that when I'm reviewing a manuscript or when I'm reading a paper, I'm, I want the author to prove to me beyond a reasonable doubt, I mean, it's, you know, to take a phrase from legal terminology, that their conclusions are really well supported by the data. Um, and if I read a, a, a proposal or a manuscript or a paper, I go through it critically and I, you know, the authors have considered alternative explanations. They've done a really good job in the measurement program that they've made. I don't have any problem with uh, logic steps that they built in the paper, I, base, I accept their conclusions. So, you know, thinking critically, reading critically is part of our, you know, as scientists, it's part of our job. You know, does this make sense or not? The other thing about best available um, is that scientific articles go through different levels of peer review. And the first level of peer review is when you submit it to a journal. So typically that will go to two experts. Hopefully they'll do a careful job and then an editor or two. And if it passes their their test, then it gets published. But even more importantly than that, these papers are there forever and they have to stand the test of time. And um, we know that paper, papers, and I, it's not the papers themselves, but the concepts, the principles that are produced and the, they're written in the paper, if they stand the test of time, if the scientific community continues to cite these papers as you know legitimate, this is, this is logical, this makes sense, as opposed to a series of articles tearing this paper down, this is completely flawed. The methods were flawed, the analyses were flawed. So there are kind of two stages of peer review. So having a paper published in a peer reviewed journal should give us confidence that it's high quality science, but it's, it, it, that's necessary but not sufficient. It has to stand the test of time. It, it has to be exposed to critical evaluation by the entire scientific community. And that's a scientist answer to your question. It's probably not what you were hoping for, but that's the best I can do. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. And before John asked this question, I didn't follow the rules. He wanted, me, he wanted me to talk about connectivity between the Bay and the Delta, <laughs> and I thought there was a bigger story to tell than that, so. It was, it's a very good story, so much appreciated. Um, so I just wanted to ask, uh, Given, given the challenges of these issues, but the, like you were saying, that there are opportunities and we can think about things that we can manage, how can we use science to prioritize issues and to really identify what are the, what are the critical uncertainties or also what are the critical issues where we do have opportunities to manage things and really have an effect? Yeah. Is that a question? Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> um, uncertainties, maybe. Yeah. 
let's see, where do we go with this? Um, I think I think one of one of the lessons about uncertainties is that we should expect that the bigger the scale of variability that we're looking at, the bigger the uncertainties are going to be probably. So I think we should accept that. I think we should accept the the fact that the delta is going to be continue to be driven by large scale regional and local scale processes. That it's important for us to pay attention to all all three of them. I think that's one of the key messages. So. In terms of monitoring, we have these great monitoring programs in the Bay and in the Delta. We also need equally good monitoring programs in the atmosphere, in the watersheds. And so I don't know where the big data gaps, the big uncertainties are in terms of data in the watershed and across the ocean and atmospherically. But um, I think paying attention is really important. I mean, John, you probably get a, a thousand ideas about what to do with the Delta Science Program every day. I'm going to give you one. <laughs> And that is, um, I could imagine the value of an office whose responsibility it is to pay attention to what's going on in the watershed, what's going on in the Pacific, and what's going on in the Bay and the Delta, um, with the idea of alerting people when uh, new developments arise, and also start building the depth of our understanding of this connectivity across. So I'll give you an example um, of why this would be helpful from the scientist perspective. A couple of years ago, you know, our ship goes from San Jose up to Rio Vista, and we were sampling in Rio Vista in the summertime. I don't remember what year it was, and we were measured really, really high chlorophyll concentrations in the lower Sacramento River. We'd never seen that before. What the heck is this? We looked at it under the microscope. It was a big bloom of a freshwater diatom. I found out later that this was the, this was the result of an experiment to flood uh, Yolo bypass to generate blooms. I had no idea that this was going on. Um, if if there was a clearinghouse of okay, this exp this is going on. The gate that was closed uh, during the four-year drought. I had no idea that that ex that that was going on. So if there was a clearinghouse, an office where somebody or some group of people could be paying very close attention to things like okay, there's this atmospheric river that's developing. We're projecting next week is going to be a major rainfall event, um, or this levee is about to break. There's a storm. This levee is about to break. Uh, we're going to open this gate for this period, and then we're going to close it for this period, or we're going to flood this floodplain. It would be really valuable for the monitoring and research communities to know about those things in advance. It, it, not only those kinds of events, but also to have somebody paying attention to what's going on. I mean. This is going to be a wet year now. This is shaping up to be a wet year. What does that mean for water management? What does that mean for stratification of the South Bay? We get big blooms during wet years. What does that mean for these fish communities that seem to be tied to, to precipitation and, and runoff? And maybe that's more than, than can be accomplished. I don't know if it's even feasible. I just know that it's an office that would be very useful. And the job would be to connect across these three scales. That would be the job. And if you wanted to have somebody look at connectivity between the Bay and the Delta, that's okay, too. <laughs> One last question. Well, I'm drawn to agreeing with your limnologists and oceanographer friends that it's crazy to try and, and get a handle on this. And, and with all that complication, uh, thinking about how to manage a regulatory uh, uh, approach to any of this to accomplish specific objectives or to save, you know, uh, endangered species. Because even if we monitor it, there's nobody who has regulatory authority broad enough to deal with these variables. So. Uh, I understand your concern that giving this talk would lead people to throw their hands up. That's kind of where I am. Yeah. Talk me off the ledge. Yeah. So I, I, I'm going to take a, a stab at trying to be a little more optimistic here. I think about this example. This is an example where we have this really complicated life cycle, but they've identified three places that are important. And, you know, my message on that is that from what we can control. We can't control this one down here. We can't control ocean conditions. But to some extent, I mean, we, ha we might have a modest effect on freshwater flow 
And maybe there are things that we can do. In fact, we are doing some things to regulate water temperature in, in streams. So I think this kind of approach is useful because it tells you of all the things that are going on, these two are pretty important. We should put our emphasis on, on these two things. Whereas before, I mean, I, I didn't know that. Maybe the salmon biologists know that. Um, you know, we want to develop policies that are, that are going to be impactful, that are, that are going to be successful. And I think that we need to at least be aware of the challenges to developing policies that are successful and what the limitations are. I think we should be realistic about there are limitations that, that we just can't put controls on. But um, I, I um, greatly sympathize with, these, with this dizzying array of, of challenging questions that people like the members of the State Board have to deal with. It, I mean, I have great admiration for the courage that they, take, that they have to take on these challenging questions. And you now we are trying our best, the, the scientific community is trying our best to tease out the complexities of the system and communicate it in a way that can be useful and actionable. I don't know if we're succeeding or not, but I can tell you that we're putting great effort into this. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.